Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you for choosing this session. I'm April Aj, I'm the executive director at the McNulty Foundation. I'm here with my colleague, Nina Sani. We are so honored to co-host this session with our partners at the Aspen Institute. Tommy Loper's here and Lola and Olivia. Uh, all of our panelists have so many accomplishments and accolades. Among them, they are all recipients of the prize we give with the Aspen Institute for Moral Courage and Leadership. They are all fellows of the Aspen Institute, but we're grateful today that they're just showing up as human beings to, and willing, willing to really share their personal journey uh, and the challenges in this work. So we asked Jay to be our kind of lead discussant uh, and moderator for the session. Jay's gonna start us off just reflecting a little bit and leading us into the terrain that we hope to cover today. We'll have the panel and then we'll ask all of you to do a little reflection. Um, when you email with Jay, you notice he always signs his emails in community. And I just wanted to point out that Jay has a really special gift for being in community with so much intention and care. So we're really grateful to you, Jay, for gathering us all in community around the topic of exercising moral courage. Thank you. Yes, please. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see some familiar faces and also really nice to see some faces that are friends that I haven't yet met. Um, thanks for making the choice to be here today uh, for what feels like a pretty important uh, conversation. And I know that I'm joined by these incredible panelists in thinking that we're here to kick off a conversation and be some be catalysts. And But the most important part of the day will actually be when you're probably talking amongst yourselves at your tables. And so we hope to catalyze, give you enough fodder to catalyze some good reflections at your own table, and then we'll circle back at the end. Uh, but just know that we're not thinking that we're dispensing uh, you know, wisdom on these tablets from on high, but we're just sort of trying to catalyze a conversation. Um, so with that, um, welcome, thank you to the McNulty Foundation, to the Aspen Institute, to our friends at Skoll for helping to convene this. Um, this conversation's happened for the last couple of years and has sort of grown into a series of conversations around moral courage, around uh, renewal, um, and, uh, and we think that this is uh, important stuff that takes us out of the everyday sort of drive energy that most of us are sort of heavily type A individuals who constantly feel like we're not enough and there's more things that we have to do and more things that we have to do and the, the ring keeps on ascending and how do we renew and refresh ourselves, particularly in difficult times. Um, I guess the thing that I'd like to share uh, before briefly introducing our panelists and having them tell their stories is uh, this is framed around this isn't easy, you know, a dialogue around moral courage. And as I've heard people talk about moral courage in this reference to this panel or other places over the last few days, I've often heard it framed in ways that um, are around like speaking truth to power or taking action uh, even when it might come at great personal risk. And those are, those are obviously uh, incredible examples of when moral courage is required. Um, but I also want to say um, that that's not the only way that moral courage uh, can exhibit itself. And, uh, and then I'm gonna share from my own personal experience that I have an emerging feeling that it might also not be the most important way that moral courage is needed uh, in this moment, particularly from my context in the United States, um, but, and perhaps as you might experience it in your places from all around the world. Um, as I've experienced it, particularly in the last six months, as um, uh, a, a, Jew, a person of Jewish ancestry, uh, who's also uh, an aspiring ally, co-conspirator, and anti-racist pro-justice spaces. There's been immense sort of cross currents and undertoes and rogue waves uh, coming at us around when multiple identities are in conflict. And, um, and in those moments, there's often a very loud, urgent cry for moral clarity. And 
what I'd like to share is that sometimes moral courage for me has been when I can uh, lovingly resist an understandable urgent call for moral clarity in a time when uh, things aren't so clear. And so with that in mind, um, in October, November of last year, in a, in a time of sort of deep reflection and a lot of uh, relationships that were fraying and, uh, and others in danger of fraying in different communities that I've been a part of, where my role has often been to hold space um, and my, my self-image has been as a bridger. I was wondering, like, what if anything was being called of me? Uh, I was reading uh, a, some Parker Palmer uh, around vocation, and I tried to think of what am I being called to do here? And I realized that the, the trope was about mistakenly thinking that the call was what to do as opposed to maybe how to be. And as a super type A, hyper serial entrepreneur, like I'm very comfortable in the, in the doing energy and I'm much less comfortable in the being space, the stuff that's sort of below the neck. And, uh, and so I wanted to share what I ended up writing uh, for myself as an essay I realized was actually a prayer. It was better, for, it was better articulated as a prayer mostly from myself as something I could read to myself before I went to bed or when I woke up or when I was feeling challenged. And then I chose uh, to then share that prayer uh, publicly in a, in a small piece of writing. So what I'd love to do just to kick off our framing is not to negate or to diminish the speaking truth to power or the taking action at great risk and all the other ways that we might think of moral courage, but also just to expand the aperture on what's possible uh, and how we interpret moral courage. And so I'll share this with you. Um, I'll share this with you now, if you'll indulge me. Take a, maybe a minute. Um, and uh, I will need these in order to read it. The, the title of the prayer is, Who or What Am I Most Resisting Right Now? Who or what am I most resisting right now? Lord, help me lovingly resist people who express ideas that oversimplify complex issues. Help me lovingly resist people who speak their truth in a way that erases my lived experience and dismisses my understanding of those complex and deeply personal issues. Help me lovingly resist people who insist that their experience is the only experience that matters, their feelings the only feelings that matter, their truth the only possible truth. Help me complicate narratives, recognizing the danger of a single story. May I seek to understand why people think differently than I do. May I stretch myself to acknowledge what might be true in their perspective, even if I don't accept everything they say or find the way they say it helpful. Lord, help others try to feel what I'm feeling so they might see me more clearly. May they reflect on what is my what in my beliefs makes them uncomfortable and why. May they be open to being shaped by my experience and my views, yet before I can expect that of others, you have shown me that I need to offer that to others. That is hard and time-consuming work. I am tempted by the easier path to settle into comfortable judgments and self-righteousness. I am tempted to have more time to do more enjoyable things I am tempted to feel safer and validated in the company of those who agree with me. Yet, I know others are also tempted to choose the same easier path. And we will move farther apart and we will become more entrenched in our unchallenged beliefs. Lord, give me strength to avoid this path of least resistance that leaves me poorer, weaker, and less safe. So um, that's my personal share to just sort of throw into the, into the, the stone soup pot. And uh, now I'd love to just briefly 
introduce Rajani Woodruff, uh, Dixon Chavanda, and uh, Ami Eugene, Eugene Banks. Um, and their incredible work, You'll, you've, you've got all their bios, I won't do a lot of that, but we have a finance innovator working in rural economic development in South Africa, a mental health innovator uh, working to build connection and healing in Zimbabwe, and an incredible education innovator working on economic mobility uh, in the US. They're bringing a vast set of different lived experiences and professional and vocational expertise. And I'd love to start, uh, perhaps, on me with you, and, and just share maybe a little bit of the origin story of your work, and particularly around the concept of uh, when did you first sort of feel called uh, to your higher purpose? And uh, if and how had that, has that evolved over time? Uh, thanks so much for having me. Again, my name is Ami Eubanks Davis. I hope you can hear me. If you can't, let me know and I will put my teacher voice on. Tommy told me he can hear me. Uh, I am so honored to be here with you all. Um, and my personal life story really does reflect the work of Braven. Um, it's also a fun moment for me because being across the pond, there is a dear friend in the audience, Liz Thompson, uh, who will understand this story a bit more maybe than others in the room because we both grew up in the city of Chicago in really hardworking neighborhoods. I never knew someone who did not work hard that happened to be black and happened to be lower income. And my parents actually built a business over a 10-year span uh, that allowed my older sister and I to really experience economic mobility. And I think often people talk about economic mobility from a philosophical standpoint. It's really different to actually understand from a lived experience what happens when more money comes into a household. Without a doubt, young people have more opportunities. So looking at my 28 first cousins who are mainly Southsiders and people I go to church with to this day, one of my daughters will be confirmed in a month or so and she'll be a fifth generation uh, part of our family in that church. Uh, I was never ever um, uncertain that my parents' hard work had a lot of luck in it because there were a lot of other people who got lucky. And so I really got called first into the world of education after college to really want to pay it forward into the black community and do something to try to help other young people have a path. And I felt like education often is the great equalizer to that. So I joined Teach for America where I then taught sixth grade in New Orleans, Louisiana. And basically, to speed it up a little bit more, I taught this group of sixth graders who happened to graduate from college, if they made the decision to go, the year of Hurricane Katrina. And that is where the work of Braven really starts to come to be in my own, like, something is not right. Because I think many of you might remember Katrina completely decimated the city of New Orleans for really over a year. However, the young people who were in school in New Orleans, if they were in higher education at Dillard University or Xavier University, those are historically black colleges and universities in the US, or at Tulane or LSU, or were out of state at a Northwestern University, which is outside of Chicago, they actually were sitting in places where the economy was just fine. There was nothing that happened to those cities. And so when my students started to struggle to get jobs coming out of some of our best universities and colleges, and we had this hurricane going on, I at first started to blame it on New Orleans being underwater. It got really clear to me that something else was wrong because they could work in Atlanta, they could work in Chicago, they could work in Houston. And one of my very favorite students coming out of Northwestern University um, was on her way into applying to Teach for America where I had been and then started to build out a career for 13 years. And one of my very favorite recruiters happened to meet her on campus and came back to the office and said, I met Katika Guter, she's amazing she's not gonna get into Teach for America. And I was like, I cannot even understand this. After really what was two decades of doing everything right, something was happening where she didn't seem like a great candidate. Um, and ultimately she ends up getting in and, and just winning a bunch of awards, including one of the biggest teaching awards Teach for America gives. Um, and then I enter the Pahara Aspen Fellowship and have this moment to really step back and reflect on my work. And I was uh, voluntold to do a project. Um, and it started out as a paper about the lost talent of the country, and it then grew into this real fascination and obsession with how could first generation going, mainly from low income background students, actually get all the way through our higher education system and come out and earn 66 cents on the dollar versus an entire dollar. I mean, thank you. 
and uh, sorry, I think I, I messed up your name. I mangled it a little bit. That's I apologize. No, Eubanks Davis, but I, I like the Eugene Davis. I was like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for that. No, you're good. Dixon, I'm curious, same, same question for you. Like, when, when did you sort of find your purpose? How is it, if and how has it shifted over time? Sure. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, in my case, really, um, you know, during my formative years as a psychiatrist, I lost uh, a patient uh, to suicide. And that was really the beginning of my journey with the friendship bench. Um, it was really my way of escaping the pain, the tragedy, the, 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 the imposter syndrome. And so I started off with, um, with 14 grandmothers who I trained in the basics of cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, fast forward, we now have well over 2,000 grandmas who are providing therapy to, um, to hundreds of thousands of people. Last year, over 200,000 people sat down on a bench with a grandma to receive um, therapy. But I really want to start off by sharing what I consider to be the most important grounding piece of lesson that I've picked up over the years from my interactions with the grandmas, and that is learning how to be comfortable with being vulnerable. And it's a constant struggle when you are at the top to constantly remind yourself, I have to be comfortable with being vulnerable. I'll stop there and I can share more about that. Thank you. Rajan. <clears throat> Thanks, Jay. Um, so uh, the, my personal story um, uh, shows that um, purpose can start in one way and then, and then evolve. But um, I guess it all, it all adds up and, and, and comes together into, into one life journey. And as you said, there isn't one story, there isn't one narrative. Uh, there are many strings that you can pull on in, in a life story. But um, where, where it started for me was um, in apartheid South Africa. Um, I was born in, in 1974 and our family were forced to be removed from District 6. Some of you might know it's uh, one of the famous forced removals uh, in the country. And then being mixed race, we were moved to uh, what was called the colored ghetto um, in, uh, on the Cape Flats. Um, so, so political, um, um, uh, you know, political activism uh, was part of my life from a very early age. And uh, I was 12 years old when I was involved in student activist organization and then chairperson of the SRC um, by the time I was 15. So it was very much part of my uh, very early life. Um, and, uh, and then part of the anti-apartheid struggle through, through the 80s. And then we got democracy and we all thought the job was done. Um, we could sit back and enjoy the fruits of uh, our work and, uh, and we were the rainbow nation and we had our father Nelson Mandela leading us into the promised land um, and everything was going to be just fine. So off I went to university and, um, uh, started and studied a degree in business science um, with a major in economics and, uh, and you know, that was what uh, you know, what I needed to do and not worry about anything else in the world, really. Um, and uh, I was uh, offered a, um, a job uh, with uh, Merrill Lynch uh, Investment Banking straight out of university, which I very happily took and started building my career in finance. And after about 10 years um, of doing that, and, uh, you know, I had this career that was, um, was growing and many doors were opening, and I thought... Well, the gold price went down yesterday, and now it's going up, and then interest rates are going down, and then the rands do, and the, what is this all about? And, uh, and I was bored and, uh, and, and frustrated, and I thought, well, wh when was I energized? When did I feel alive? And it was during those anti-apartheid struggle uh, movement times, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea. Um, so I thought, well, I was going to take a sabbatical and go back to school and do a master's in development economics because I, I was an economist and financial economics was what I studied before. So I thought, well, let me study development economics and maybe I'll find out what it is I'm supposed to do. Um, and that, of course, didn't tell me what I was supposed to do. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the stars aligned and I met um, the person who was to become my life partner. Um, 
Dave Barton, and he, funnily enough, also been a business science student, but he was starting a, um, a backpackers lodge in a very remote part of uh, what was called uh, the, the Trans Sky in those days, and it was a, um, a black homeland under apartheid. So completely cut off, uh, no infrastructure, uh, no no electricity, water, sanitation, access to healthcare, education, as remote as you can imagine. Um, in fact, to, uh, there was no road at all at the time, and uh, you had to go on, yeah, I mean, if you imagine where it's, uh, as the crow flies, about 20, uh, 20, 30 kilometers from when Nelson Mandela was born. So you imagine these rolling green hills, round huts with grass roofs, that's exactly where uh, the place is, on the coastline of, of the Wild Coast, which is 300 kilometers of the most beautiful coastline uh, in the country. Um, and, uh, and he uh, was, just loved backpacking at crossed Africa for 18 months from Cape Town to London and he wanted to do something with backpacking and development and uh, and came to this remote community and, and we got together and I was still studying in finance, um, traveling back and forth in the last five kilometers you had to walk, there was no way to get there unless you had a very good 4x4. Four four. Um, so it was amazing, it was fantastic, I was falling in love, he, you know, falling in love with the place, falling in love with the man, you know, um, and, uh, and um, the Bulungula Lodge then was this project he was doing. And it, it, it was doing very well um, and was fair, becoming fair trade accredited, creating the first jobs in the community, it was a joint venture with the community, it was an amazing development community project. And in 2006, a third of the babies died of diarrhea from lack of access to clean drinking water. And um, I, I, I knew this community. I mean, uh, you know, we were living there. Dave was living there. I was, I was traveling back and forth. And, uh, and we were um, digging graves of this size. Mm -hmm. yeah, these were the coffin sizes. And uh, we later did a survey and found that 53% of households had lost at least one child to diarrhea from lack of access to clean drinking water, and one in nine had lost three or more. I knew families that lost eight children. And we were sitting on the veranda of the Bulugula Lodge and saying, it's fair trade accreditors, creating jobs. What are we doing? Like, what are we doing here? Um, as much as this was a great community project, we needed to do something else. And uh, the Bulungula Incubator was born. We had no idea what we were doing, um, except for raising funds to, to buy water tanks and, and do something about it. And since then, the organization has grown, now employs 180 full-time staff members and has a um, strategy in holistic place-based uh, uh, strategies that we implement in remote rural communities. Uh, and uh, and it, it really goes what we call cradle to career, preconception to career, about what does the place need, what do, the, what, do these, what do communities need, not about the particular program that you uh, attach to and that you want to implement. What is it that communities really need um, to change their lives? And, uh, yeah, that's the story. Thank you, Rishan. So maybe I'm going to just pick up where you left off, unless you need a little minute to... Breathe, in which case you can pass, and we'll go to, to Dixon. But um, you said a couple things that I'm wondering if you would be willing to expand upon. Sure. No one is, um, you talked about that moment where you had been doing something together with your love that you then decided to do something entirely different, mm -hmm. that you had really no idea what it, how to do it or what it might be. And that seems like a, an inflection point yeah. that requires some form of courage. And so I was wondering if you would talk about that. And, and then the other moment that I heard was uh, a sense of, a related sense of we didn't know where we were going, so it had to be emergent. Mm -hmm. and, listen, and, and listening was a big part of that strategy, which, which may then tee up uh, Dixon, because in, in, I might hear some of that in your story. But if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that, those two inflection points. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, um, you know, human beings are, are interesting. I mean, we've got a bit of a bug in our software is that, you know, you can, you can look at, at problems on a spreadsheet and thousands of people are suffering in some way, but 
It's really only when we feel that human connection, when we're proximate to communities, when we're living in communities and when we're there, that we find the courage uh, to do what it is we need to do. I mean, it's like, it's like if you say to a mother, you know, there's a, there's a vehicle there that weighs a ton, could you lift that, you know, in weight? She'd say, no, there's no chance. Put a baby under a car and she needs to lift that car to save a child, she'll find the strength, right? So the strength is not in your head, it's not in your arms, the strength is in your heart. And that's where the courage comes from. So when you see what it is that, um, you know, whatever the issues are or the problems that you have or whatever it is that you're struggling with, um, it's when you put yourself in those situations that the courage just emerges and all you've got to do is get out of the way. Um, and, 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 and you'll know what it is. You'll find your North Star, uh, you know, it'll be there. You're not going to think yourself to your North Star. You're going to feel yourself to your North Star because when we think of courage, we know it's a feeling, it's not a thought. Um, and, and last night when David White um, uh, uh, performed the poem Just Beyond Yourself, it, it, it's exactly what, um, what, what I mean when I talk about feeling uh, the courage, and that's what happened to me. Um, and uh, if you remember um, his poem, um, Just Beyond Yourself, uh, he says, um, it's where you need to be. Um, uh, in in the in the place of uh, half a step to self forgetting uh, is where um, is where you need to be. So half a step to self forgetting is getting yourself out of the way, forgetting about yourself, and uh, and what you'll find there is what will restore. Uh, um, you know, uh, you know what it is that you that you're trying to that you're seeking. So, um, so uh, when I when I when I think about you know this idea of self forgetting and getting out of the way and just letting your your feeling um, and your heart emerge, I don't mean that um, that there isn't a role for self care. In fact, there's an imperative for self care in all of this because we can't do this work, and I think that's probably a fantastic fantastic segue to, to Dixon is that, you know, we can't do this work if we're not taking care of ourselves. The only thing we have when we show up to our communities, to our families, to our loved ones is our mind. That's all we have. So we have to keep our minds healthy. And we know that we have to keep, we've been sold on the fact that we've got to keep our bodies healthy. So we exercise, we go to the gym, we eat the right foods. But do we take time to meditate? Do we take time for whatever your, your you know, your spiritual practice is? Uh, do we take time to think about um, how we how we showing up in the world? So you don't have the bandwidth to speak to a grandmother um, who's come to your office with some problem. If you're worrying about connecting to your Zoom call and talking to, you know, the Gates Foundation, the Alma Foundation, and I'm too busy and I can't talk to her because I need to get on the call with my funders. She's right in front of you and she's complaining about her sore knees, and you don't have time to actually just say hello and sympathize with her sore knees, right? I mean, that, that, that's what happens to us on a daily basis, remembering that. So you can't do that if you're underslept. You can't do that if you're irritated and you're tired. You can only do that if you're taking care of yourself. So self-forgetting and self-care sound like a contradiction, but they're not. They're the, the two sides of the same coin. Thank you. Dixon, what's coming up for you? Um, maybe carrying on from where I left off. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay. That's fine. So, you know, I touched on uh, the subject of feeling comfortable uh, with being vulnerable. But how do we make that happen? And, and one of the things I've learned, uh, again, from the interactions with the grandmothers is the, the importance of creating that space for people to feel comfortable to share their stories um, a lot of people think of Friendship Bench as this, um, you know, very uh, structured scientific intervention. But at the core of what we do, really, is making people feel comfortable to share their stories and making people feel comfortable to feel vulnerable because it's through that process that healing actually um, begins. And um, we anchor all of that in, um, in our values at Friendship Bench, which are empathy, connectedness, anchored in, in research. And I try to live those values, you know. Um, so my North Star, if you like, is around those values. 
And it's, it's a struggle constantly to try and hold on to those values, you know. Um, and so I think I'll go back again to, what I, to where I started. And I think the most important fundamental lesson about connecting human beings is, is really about being comfortable with being vulnerable because all of us are extremely vulnerable, particularly as professionals, you know. And when we embrace that vulnerability, we become better human beings. Uh, this is one of the things I've, I've, I've really learned from, from the grandmothers and, and this work that I've been doing for over a decade. I mean, what's, what's bubbling up for yeah, you? Yeah, so I'm actually gonna go into the world of the United States uh, is a place that is often thought to be the land of opportunity because of the democracy that got built so early on. Um, and I would definitely say it is a place where you really should be able to, and for many, many years, you could actually come from more humble beginnings and honestly rise um, in our country. Um, and that said, race and class and gender really do play a big role in who gets access to capital, who gets access to certain jobs, who gets access to education, healthcare, et cetera. And so when I think about Braven and how it really started to come to be was that in America, some of you all might have heard of this thing called the American dream. We basically promise young people that if they work hard, they do everything right, they will be able to reach the American dream, which means being able to do whatever you feel called to do as a human being, um, but honestly be able to support your family as well. And so I really came into the world of Braven after a very long career in, on the K-12 side of education. And I talked about my former students, and basically the thing that really, really made me say I had to take this on was that I had promised them that through the doors of higher education was gonna come economic freedom. And with that group of students, they not only were not seeing that, but they had actually been shackled with debt that I had actually told them when they were 11 years old, if they like went to college, and then I was like one of the people giving them advice about taking out loans and having debt uh, to get their bachelor's degrees and to basically sort of all of a sudden realize that that was not going to be true for them and they actually might be worse off um, because of how the debt load has now started to work in the United States around acquiring a higher education degree, which has skyrocketed in the last uh, 20 to 25 years. And so that said, when I get into the Pahara Aspen Fellowship and I really step back and reflect on how I might pay it forward into the education community, I actually made an assumption, and this is a little bit connected to donors, that once I started to realize that something was wrong and I might be able to figure out a solution and I had a chance um, encounter with a donor of Teach for America who decided to actually give some money to invest in this Braven idea, which wasn't even called Braven at the time, I thought I was gonna be able to just kind of take off <laughs> with the idea because I had worked so closely with Wendy Kopp, who is a legendary social entrepreneur, not only in the United States, but now across the world. And very quickly, I realized that I was not going to have the same success fundraising as she, was as she had had, even though I had helped build Teach for America when it was growing at 36% a year. And there were donors of Teach for America who knew that I was starting this new thing who were like, yeah, no, <laughs> we don't think that you're going to be able to really build this. Um, and so one thing that I learned from Braven was how important it was to actually go slow to go fast and actually build out the model, which is a model inside of higher education where students take Braven as a course, as a part of their higher ed experience. And it's a three-year experience, so they go through this course and then two and a half years of an experience where they meet with professionals and get mentorship and a coach and all that and really break open their social capital networks. That said, uh, what was really interesting was it really did take having the courage to ask Wendy and other white social entrepreneurs to actually help me fundraise. Because until I met Liz Thompson, uh, who I said earlier is in the room, she was the first person who happens to be a black woman who actually said, when I said, here's what I'm doing, here's why I'm doing it, that was like, I get it, oh yeah, I'm gonna help you, we're gonna get this done here in Chicago. But otherwise, it was two and a half years of no one giving us any additional money. 
which I still can't get over because of the track record that I had. But really it was Wendy and other people calling behind the scenes to say, we actually need this in K-12 education. We need this higher education piece because we've been doing all this and it's not gonna be a return on investment. Mm -hmm. But the, the funder dynamics can be really, really interesting, um, mm -hmm. I would say, especially in the beginning and over time, the results just started to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope she won't mind my calling on her, Hope. So I'm just signaling that I'm gonna, uh, that um, that uh, you can pass. You always have the right to pass, but there was just a, a bringing into the space of the power of story and art and as a form of connection. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's anything, you're such a source of wisdom, uh, if there's anything that you wanna share. How do I tell? How do I tell my children the truth? In this space, I have to tell the truth. How do I embrace truth telling? How do I take their innocence, turn their eyes from the light they have known to the darkness I have seen? How? They ask and ask and ask, but how do I start? We argue and argue and how do I start? How do I begin? They don't see me, I don't see them. My truth is hidden in my pain. I want to tell them, but I have to protect them. And the only way through this is my story. So how do I start? How do I tell them that I am still putting my pieces together? How? I am me, but I'm someone else too. I am the child who grew up with no home, my childhood taken for I was seeking a home. My home did not want me. My home did not claim me. Born with no birth date, my name a means to an end. But how will they understand? I can't hide the truth anymore. I can't hide the truth forever. Should I tell them that I have stared death in the eye? I have dodged it countless times only to learn that death Death is part of life. Death is a fact of life. From dust to dust and from uh, tumbling soils and from falling leaves, from earth we are born to earth we return. How do I tell them that this life is fleeing like a shooting star? That was improv. <laughs> like, that was beautiful, Hope. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if we could turn uh, back to the, our panel. And you were bringing an ear to a few tables and also having a chance to reflect on this topic a little bit and what's been sitting with you. And I'm wondering if maybe starting with Ami, if, uh, if you might share, as you, as you think looking forward, uh, what's the thing that you want to be working on for yourself that in your vision of the future, not just the future of your organization and the world, but also who you need to be or who you need to become in the process of becoming yeah. to uh, manifest that future? Well, I feel like we heard this from the folks who also got up and spoke and definitely at the table I was listening into for a little bit. Um, you know, one thing that I really want to take forward, and I think I have actually learned this in um, this unlikely journey that I've been on, is that renewal for me really does come through people and actually really being able to listen to understand people who's whose identities might be very different than mine in the United States, I would say whose politics might be different than mine, um, because it's so important to find the common ground if we at all want any shot of being able to make big problems um, have solutions. And so I really want to stay committed to trying to figure out how I can do that better um, alongside other people uh, to make sure that people who are far more vulnerable than any of us in this room really do have the opportunities they deserve. Thank you. Dixon? Thank you. Um, I'll go back to where I started being, feeling comfortable with being vulnerable. And um, I think what has helped me 
something that I encourage all of us to try and do is create a vulnerability bank. A vulnerability bank is a place where you put all the things that you fall back on when shit hits the fan. <laughs> um, so with regards to interacting with funders, I want to share one important vulnerability bank which has helped me significantly. Always ask yourself, and this is for implementers, always ask yourself as an implementer, of all the funders out there that support me or that I interact with, who do I truly feel comfortable being vulnerable to? Mm. And when things go wrong, that's the first person you call. Mm. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Dixon. Rajan. Um, yeah, Jay, I wanted to pick up on, um, you know, when you started us off um, on your prayer and uh, you spoke about... Um, what was your line about simplicity and complexity, not to make uh, what's complex simple? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I thought that was so, it, w it was so important and it was interesting that that was, um, you know, what, what was the thread uh, through, through your prayer. And when we're talking about community, um, it is amazing and connection and it gives us so much and it's who we are. I mean, many of you will know the word Ubuntu, um, which is an African word about, you know, I am because of other people, I am because of my community. But communities are messy. <laughs> very, very messy and very complex. Um, and they, they, they teach you what the word tolerance really means <laughs> because uh, you've got to live together and you've got to stick together. And when we're talking about courage, I mean, of course, there's, um, you know, the courage um, around funders. Um, Dixon spoke about, I mean, his point was so, so interesting. Um, about the vulnerability bank, um, you know, when you talk about speaking truth to power, um, those are important um, forms of courage. But also when you're working in community, um, and, you know, I can give you some examples of, uh, we had a case uh, where we had a, a grade R, uh, which is your year before you go to grade one at school. I don't know if that's kindergarten in some places. And we had the, the grade R teacher and her assistant. And the grade R teacher accused the assistant of practicing witchcraft. Um, and, uh, and it was a problem because, uh, you know, there were meetings convened in the community and half of the community believed that the assistant teacher was a witch and there were examples of how you walked into a house and the pillow was on that chair and then it was on, moved to that chair. So obviously that was evidence of her being a witch. Um, and uh, there was a break-in at the great art teacher's house and somebody took underwear and as you know, underwear is what you use to put spells on people. So. Oh, um, so now you've got a case uh, where, of course, labor law doesn't allow us to uh, fire somebody because of, uh, you know, this accusation. In fact, in South Africa, there is a law against accusing somebody of a witch. In fact, it went to court because, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a, you're breaking a law, uh, accusing somebody of being a witch. Because you can imagine the implications of it. So you had half the community wanting to drive her and her mother out of the village and the other half of the community not wanting. The community was quite split. Um, and then you have an organization that actually has employed somebody with a permanent employment contract, and so what do you do? And it was a tough two years. It was really, really tough. And, uh, and so, yeah, and so we had to dig deep. Um, we had to find ways to, um, you know, maintain, keep her job, give her a job in a different community, create a job, create a situation uh, that the, was acceptable to the community and the, their children that are being taught in the preschool, and then also to, to straight to, to the law and to, and to both um, people in the, in the situation as best we can. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, even the, the high school, the Bulungula College that, that we built, um, you know, was struck by lightning. And we also, um, very unluckily, um, we, we lost one of our students, amazingly struck by lightning. What are the chances? Um, and to go through all of that and the accusations of witchcraft that comes from that. So, um, so, so to say that, you know, uh, you have to find courage in many different situations and many messy situations. Um, and then just to finally say that, um, you know, Jay was asking us 
for, uh, to, to say what we wish for ourselves, not just for our organization or for society. And I think it's to always try and keep a beginner's mind, you know, to always try to keep your mind open um, and open to what the mystery is of, of every human being um, that you meet, the mystery of, of our world. Um, in fact, we did a session with Stace Lindsay and we found guiding words and my guiding words that came out was revealing mystery and, uh, and I, I wish for myself to always maintain maintain that openness and to remember just, um, you know, Hope's amazing poem. And I can tell you, I'm on this panel, that was not planned. <laughs> Jay really put Hope on the spot and she came up with that poem and I mean, it was, you know, blew us away. And, uh, and she spoke about um, darkness and the light and just always remember that darkness does not drive out darkness, only light can drive out darkness. Thank you. Um, there's so much wisdom here, and uh, I'm going to share one tiny little unanticipated story, and then I'm going to wrap, which is, um, who knew that underwear could be used to cast a spell? <laughs> but I realized that one of the moments of flow and joy in my family was at the beginning of a year-long sabbatical that our family chose to take uh, after selling a business while we were in a period of sort of liminal space of not knowing what was next and having the courage to be in a liminal space of not knowing what was next. Our kids were like four and five and our daughter somehow or other decided that the thing to do as she was sitting on the floor playing, she put, I think, our son's underwear on her head <laughs> and was just like being all goofy. And I've never seen my son laugh so hard for so long to the point that he was like crying, rolling on the floor. And my wife and I are just like the same thing. And there's this like moment of pure silliness and creativity and joy and playfulness that was captured on a, in a photo. So like I have this photo of my daughter wearing our son's like, you know, mm -hmm. Spider-Man underwear on her head, just being so goofy. So now I know that she cast a spell <laughs> on us that day. And I'm so happy that the authorities weren't there to arrest her because that is like one of the greatest moments of joy. And it, and it reminds me that um, the opening comment from the floor and I, um, about uh, being a tree person and that leading to connection. Um, one of the images or the, the energies that I feel from trees is this notion of the like deeper roots, stronger branches. And this work of renewal is, we often mistake the work for uh, beginning with stronger, with branches. And we try to reach out and we try to reach out, which is a bit of the doing. And, it's, and we realize that those branches can't deliver out and they eventually become vulnerable if we don't have deeper roots. And all the work, the mindfulness, the listening to grandmas, the, all of this thing that we need to do to, to force ourselves to slow down and reflect and connect are all about getting deeper roots mm -hmm. so that when we put deposits in the vulnerability bank, those aren't just our deposits. This is a community development financial institution. This is a, this is a credit union. This is a community bank. And so we're all there for each other to hold each other through those difficult times. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just individual skills that we need to bring to the work of renewal and to finding moral courage, but that we'll often find more courage together. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to leave you with my, my wish, my prayer for you and for all of us is that we uh, can seek deeper roots, stretch ourselves to stronger branches and to be in community, especially across difference. Thank you all for being here. Have a great rest of the forum. And, Please join me in thanking our panelists and each other, Aspen, McNulty, and Skoll. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>